For those of us that aren't retired, definitely in the minority here this morning, it would be silly for us to curse the rich. We wouldn't have jobs if it weren't for people that had money to invest. And I think that whether you work for a private employer, public employer, the government, it doesn't matter. If it weren't for wealthy people in this world that actually had money to invest, we wouldn't have jobs. There wouldn't be taxes to be paid to pay salaries. Um, our economy is not perfect by any means, but I am thankful that there are people, even the company that I work for, even in China, that have money that help provide me with my employment. So, appreciate your reading this morning, Jim. I know that wasn't all it said, but that's what stood out to me was don't curse the rich because, you know, the bird may carry the message. Maybe the provider, somebody else's wings you may be riding on. So, <laughs> oh, all right. working harder than you ever did. No doubt. In 2013, I was a senior at Central Christian College in Moberly, Missouri, and I'd taken a lot of different types of classes by that time. And at that at that time, um, there this was pre-COVID, of course. There was a tide that seemed to be turning in education, the way education was given and received. Uh, I took, I was kind of their, their poster child, I guess, for something new at the time. But I, I took a lot of uh, focus courses, which were a mix of me going down on a Thursday, staying through a Saturday, and taking uh classroom instruction and then the rest was done online and then I had some online courses as well and um, one of the courses my senior year was Israel after exile and I thought when I got the textbooks and I thought when I found out my who my instructor was I already knew him but he was in his 80s I thought the history with an 80 year old this is going to be boring well, Lloyd Pelfrey is no boring man. He's probably one of the most exciting people I've ever met, regardless of whether he could hear me or not, but he could read me. And he was a great encourager. Uh, I think maybe I had been preaching here a couple, three years at that point. I think I started here in 2010 when I started back in college, but doesn't matter. It was, it was just the right course at the right time that showed me that history, when God is, is involved, is never boring. And you're going to see this list of dates of this time period that we're going to be studying through the books of Ezra, Ezra, Esther, and Nehemiah. Now, it has those names in a different order, but we're going to hit it. Ezra, Esther, and Nehemiah, so we're chronologically sound. But this all starts with the decree of Cyrus to rebuild the temple. Now, in our study in Daniel, I tried to make an emphasis that Cy Cyrus and Darius are likely the same person, that one of those names is a title, like king. So Cyrus and Darius are likely the same person. So when you see the decree of Darius and you see the decree of Cyrus, and not everybody agrees on this, but I, I think that's what it is, as do most people. They're the same person. They're just named differently. You know, Matthew had a different name, Levi. You know, it, there's all kinds of characters in the Bible, uh, historically, especially in the Old Testament, that had two names. Uh, Daniel's name uh, was his Hebrew name, but he was given a Babylonian name. Uh, and was recognized that way. Bel Belshazzar was his Babylonian name. So we have the decree of Cyrus to rebuild the temple. And I don't think we need to really get any further on that because we're not going to get much further on that uh, this morning. So I'm going to leave that slide. 
and this is what occurred um, long before that. The prophet Jeremiah prophesied in chapter 25, verse 11, and chapter 29, verse 10. And this is what he said about the nation of Israel. Uh, they were flirting with idolatry. They, they weren't being faithful to God. Um, matter of fact, many times it's referred to even as, as them prostituting themselves to idols, giving it the idea of a marriage covenant. That's how intimate it was supposed to be between Israel and God. And Jeremiah, as you know, was the weeping prophet. He wrote Lamentations, and he warned Israel over and over and over that they needed to change. They needed to return to God. And this is what the prophet says. He said, this whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. For thus says the Lord, when the 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. And I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. We just got done with Daniel. We know what happened during that 70 years. Okay. And at the end of the 70 years, Daniel starts praying. He has that final vision. I uh, explained to you how Daniel was upset when he was praying in that final vision because some of them, a group of 45,000, had returned, but things weren't going according to Daniel's plan or how he thought things should go. They weren't getting anywhere in construction of the temple. Uh, the people were not unified, and, and millions had decided just to stay in Babylon. It's all they had ever known. They'd been born there. They were fully paganized. Think about it this way. If China took over the United States tomorrow, We're gone. Our kids are our age. They're dealing with their children and their grandchildren. A lot of what we are now will be gone. They won't know how we lived because they wouldn't have experienced it. The United States would be a, a different type of place for them. This is what happened to Israel. Okay, A lot of the older people went there. They had children. They had children, 70 years, you get three generations there. And the, and the young people didn't want to leave. So who do you send back to do all the heavy lifting to rebuild the temple if the young people want to stay? It was a difficult thing. And so this was all prophesied, and this is what happened. We go to 2 Kings chapter 24. It talks about King, King uh, you know, I'm on a... Butcher Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, um, he did evil on the side of the Lord when he was 18 years old. He reigned. And at that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up to Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. This is 586 B.C., to be exact. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to the city while his servants were besieging it. And Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, gave himself up to the king of Babylon, himself and his mother and his servants and his officials and his palace officials. The king of Babylon took him prisoner in the eighth year of his reign and carried off all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut into pieces the vessels of gold and the temple of the Lord, which Solomon, king of Israel, has made, as the Lord had been told. He carried away all Jerusalem and all the officials and all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and all the smiths. None remained except the poorest people of the land. And he carried away Je Jehoiakim to Babylon, the king's mother, the king's wives, his officials, the chief men, and the land he took into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. And the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon all the men of valor, 7,000, and the craftsmen and the metal workers, 1,000, all of them strong and fit for war. And the king of Babylon made Mat Mataniah, Jehoiakim's uncle, king in his place, and changed his name to Zedekiah. Okay, there, there we go again. Somebody else having a different name. So 
you have to be uh, careful with that. And we're not going to read about Zedekiah, but that's what happened when Nebuchadnezzar, King Neb, came and besieged Jerusalem. And he had been there before, twice before. And each time, the people rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar's rules and regs and how he was reigning. The third time he came, he took everybody captive, destroyed Jerusalem, told his army, wipe it out, destroy it. And they leveled the temple that Solomon had built. And they took all the articles, the the, the altar of incense, the, the showbread table, they took it all and took it to Babylon. And we think, oh, my, that's terrible. Don't we? I think that's terrible that an invading king would come into a country and take the most precious things of that nation, plunder it, and take it home with him. We think, oh, that's terrible. It wasn't so terrible. I don't want to ruin history for you. You probably already know, but... Those things were preserved because Nebuchadnezzar came in, took them out, and put them in a safe place until the 70 years were up, and guess what happened? Those preserved fine things went back to the house of God. It's interesting how God works in our lives and in the lives of all the people in the world. We look at one situation and we think, oh, that's just terribly awful. We're looking at it in the here and now. God has a plan. They look at what may or may not have happened to our missionary. I don't know. We haven't heard from him for almost a month now. Nothing. Nobody has heard from him. And I think, oh, that's just awful. Those kids aren't going to get what they need because we don't have a backup. I don't know anybody to contact over there. Nobody knows anything. So we're waiting on the Lord to show us direction. Until that time comes, we'll just keep it here in the treasury and wait for the opportunity, I guess. Okay? Um, But even with that situation, we can pray about it and ask for for God's help in the matter. Um, Ouchu, he was an orphan himself. I don't know what's happened to him. He has explained to me several times that the country is very, very dangerous. He's worried about buying food ahead of time for the kids because he's afraid that they'll poison it and try to kill the children. Um, He sent me pictures, and I think the reason he sent it to me, because the young man looked very familiar. It's a picture of one of the older boys being drug off by army officials, and you know what they're doing with him. They're making him a soldier to put him on the front lines. The warlords are controlling everything. That's why there aren't a lot of men in Uganda, because they send their youngest men to fight against their will, and they die. So it's a desperate situation. We look at at that, we think, well, that's awful. Well, it is in the here and now. But I'm not God, and I don't understand God's plan. And somehow God is working out all this suffering all over the world for his plan. And we just found out what that was just a couple weeks ago. Do you all remember? Why was the nation of Israel having to suffer? Why did the angel show Daniel that the nation of Israel, even though they're 70 years up, was going to continue to suffer for millennia? Because God wants his people back. He wants the nation of Israel to recognize the Messiah, call him out by name, and then Jesus will come. But it's not until the nation of Israel repents and recognizes the Messiah that that's going to happen. And God will allow these atrocities over and over and over to happen because he's purging Israel. Would that be your plan? Probably wouldn't be my plan. But it's God's plan. Israel has always been his nation, his people, even now. And we're told in the the New Testament, we're not his people. We're grafted into his people. Okay, We're, We're his people because of Christ. But we weren't part of his chosen nation, Israel. We're like the stepchild who 
in ancient times got the greatest favor and certainly were blessed very greatly in this nation. Anyways, I'm getting way off the subject. <laughs> the suffering starts here. Jeremiah warned them about it. Nebuchadnezzar came in, wiped them out, hauled them all away. And the first thing he did in the first uh, time he came, which was actually 605 B.C. when he took Daniel, is he took the brightest young men to train them up in Babylonian culture, in Babylonian sciences, to give them new Babylonian names, so when they brought the rest in, they already had leadership place or leadership structure in place. And those young men like Daniel, who became prime minister of the nation, were to help with the transition of all the, ex the refugees from Israel that would come and help Nebuchadnezzar rule over them to do his will. So... We look at this and we think it, this is awful, and it is awful, but we don't know what would have happened to Israel had God not taken them away to Babylon. And remember, this is just Judah and Benjamin. Israel, the ten northern nations, all the others besides Judah and Benjamin, they're already gone. The Assyrians took them out, and they're like the lost tribes. That's how they're referred to. It's only Judah and Benjamin we're dealing with here. And God is trying to preserve his nation, and he's using Nebuchadnezzar to do it. So, moving on. Probably losing you all through all that. I hope not. So, we move forward into Isaiah. And this is where our figure Cyrus the king comes into play. Darius the king comes into play. This is a prophecy from long before this time, Isaiah 44, 24, 28, and Isaiah 45, 1 and 4. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall fulfill all my purposes. Cyrus is a pagan king. Saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built, and that's important, because it's separate from the temple. And of the temple, your foundation shall be laid. So we have two things that are going to happen. The foundation of the temple is going to be laid, and the city will be rebuilt. In Ezra, the foundation of the temple is laid. In Nehemiah, the city walls are constructed. Thus says the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I just think it's so cool. Hundreds of years before Daniel and Cyrus lived, the prophet Isaiah quotes God the Father saying, I'll call you by name, Cyrus. I name you, though you do not know me. So we move on to Ezra, where we're going to start our Israel after exile study. And a lot of this is going to be reading, and, and, and I'll probably go through it pretty quick because I don't want to belabor the subject, and I don't want you to get bored with it. Uh, because history is not boring. So I invite you during the week to refresh yourself on some of these things. Although we have the background, that's why we started with Daniel, because it gives us a big picture. Now we're going to go from that point where Cyrus issues the decree to the Israelites returning, rebuilding the temple, all the resistance that occurs there, to Nehemiah serving, and the king giving him permission to go back to rebuild the city. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be filled, we just read it, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, 
so that he made a proclamation throughout all the kingdom and also put it into writing. Now, before we get into that, I want you to notice how God operates in history through his people and through those that don't even know him. The Lord stirred up the spirit. What spirit? The human spirit, the soul. Doesn't mean it was a Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean it was a saved soul. But every person has a soul, correct? Okay. Who, who creates every person? God. So certainly God can stir the Spirit in anyone He wants. Look what He did with Nebuchadnezzar when Nebuchadnezzar got all prideful. He turned him into a wild beast. His, his soul, his spirit, became something other than human. And he went out and grazed with the animals for seven years. The king of Babylon became a laughingstock. And yet, when his mind returned and his soul was right again, he became king even greater than before and gave God, glory, and praise. Pretty amazing. So we shouldn't misunderstand that this is necessarily God's anointed servant, but this is one of God's created beings, and he stirred the spirit up in King Cyrus of Persia. So Cyrus, I, I take this as, this is not normal. This is not just Cyrus being a nice guy. This is Cyrus being led by the Lord. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Cyrus, king of Persia, wait a minute, I thought you said Babylon. Babylonians, then the Medes and the Persians. Babylonians, Greeks, Medes, and Persians. We have the Babylonians to start with. We have Alexander the Great. Then we have the Medes and the Persians. This is Cyrus. This is Darius, king of the Persians. This is him understanding who is stirring his spirit because Daniel is still serving Daniel is still representing God. Daniel is still the prime minister of Persia, even though it's no longer Babylonia. Whoever is among you, all of his people, may his God be with him, and let him go to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. So I want to make it very clear that Cyrus is proclaiming a decree that the house of God be built again in Judah, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor, in whatever place he sojourns, be assisted by the men of this place with silver, gold, with the goods and the beasts, besides free will, free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. The second part of this decree takes care of the means to get it done. First, he says, this is what's going to happen. The house of God is going to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. And not just that, I'm ordering all of you to provide the means to get it done, whether it be manpower, whether it be finances, whether it be the animals required to assist, whether it be the building materials, free will offerings. Besides free will offerings. So you're to go beyond, above and beyond, writing a check. That kind of eats at me just a little bit. How many of us go above and beyond writing a check? Now, most of us are older. We have money in which we can write a check. We no longer have all this, right? 
we, we have bad backs, we have bad knees, but resources in our bank we have. So that's what we can do. But that's not all we can do. We can pray. We can visit. We can help serve meals even. We might not be able to lift sticks and stones, but we can still serve in many capacities. So I guess where I'm getting at with my rub for all of us is don't get stuck in the rut of thinking you're serving God simply by showing up on Sunday and writing a check. That's great. We've got to do that work. But there's so much work that occurs outside the walls of this church where the rubber meets the road on a daily basis. And not all of us are retired. Not all, some of us are still working, and we can do that in our workplaces. We can serve God. But the important thing is, besides free will offerings, find your way to serve God. And it was so important that Cyrus saw the wisdom in it. Of course, he was stirred by the Lord, and he issued a decree, making it so. Then rose up the heads of the fathers, the houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred, to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. So it's very important. The heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin, the two tribes that still existed that made up all of Israel now, and the priests and the Levites. So we're going to send the elders... And we're going to send the preachers and the teachers, okay, if, it, if, if you want to modernize it. All of them who were about, all who were about them aided them with vessels of silver, with gold and goods, with beasts and costly wares, besides all that was freely offered. Cyrus the king also brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. Cyrus, king of Persia, brought these out in the charge of Mithradath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Shezbazar, the prince of Judah. This was the number of them, 30 basins of gold. 1,000 basins of silver, 29 censers, 30 bowls of gold, 410 bowls of silver, and 100 other vessels. All the vessels of gold and silver were 5,400. And all these did Shesh Balzar bring up when the exiles were brought up from Babylonia to Jerusalem. Full circle, God preserved his own stuff for the nation of Israel to take back when they rebuilt the temple to start worshiping him again. They didn't have to make new censers. They didn't have to make new bowls. They didn't have to make new plates. It was all there for them when they went back. I think I want to uh, close it there. The, the next section is a lot of names that we'll probably skip over, but I want to close it there with this thought. This was a 70-year period, give or take a little, with the nation of Israel where they're taken away and exiled to Babylon, and they return to Jerusalem. And God has preserved everything they need in their lives to worship him the way God wants to be worshipped. How did Jesus tell us now, many, many centuries later, how did Jesus tell us we are to worship God? Anyone? How are we to worship God? In spirit? And in truth, let's say you go through a rocky time and your faith wanes and wavers. Have any of you experienced that? Is everything in place for you, even if it's 10, 20 years, for you to return? Has God had, does God have everything in place for you? to worship him the way he wants to be worshipped when you wake up. He has. The word of God is just as true today as it will be 30 and 40 years from now. And this is all you need.
There's a reason that this is the number one best-selling book of all time. Because God's truth and God's Spirit are in this book. And when you read it, and you believe it, and you have faith in His Son, which this book is all about, then you have His truth and His Spirit in you. Will there ever be a time when this book is not available to us? I can't answer that question. Right now, we think times are bad, and they are, but let's put it in perspective. Is the Bible not more accessible right now than it's ever been in history? It's on your phone, it's on your TV, it's on, on your bookshelf, it's on your tablet, it's on your laptop, it's right there. I think it's good and bad because where the Bible really should be is right here. Okay, and, and I'm a terrible memorizer of scripture. I don't I don't know about you all. But you don't have to memorize God's word for word. You can say, hey, God, God indicates through the Apostle Paul, and you don't have to know which verse or even which book. God indicates through the Apostle Paul that it's good that we come together on Sundays. That, that I be a part of a Sunday worship. That, that's the normal. That's how it's supposed to be. The Bible tells me that. Somebody says, where at? And you say, well, let me Google it. And you can. Where does the Bible say that I should be in church on Sundays? It's right there. Okay, so we, we have for us at this time in our lives, even if we waver in faith, the tools we need to repent to be restored and hopefully not rebel anymore. And see, that was the circle that the nation of Israel was in. They would be restored, or they would they would be in trouble, they would they would repent, then they would be restored, they think all is well, and then they'd mess up again, start falling off idols and marrying women that weren't Jews and, and worshiping other gods, and it was a mess. And it happened over and over and over, and it's still happening. It's still happening today. Many of the Jews today hold on to the idea that worship in the temple needs to be restored. And the reason that they think that is because they don't recognize that the sacrifice, yeah. the, the, the atoning sacrifice that God desired has been made. It has been accomplished by Jesus. And someday they're going to recognize that and that will be a time of rejoicing for everyone because we'll see the Lord let's pray together Holy Father we thank you for this history that we have available to us to understand how even through uh, an awful time of exile your own people were restored to their homeland they were given all the things they needed to successfully rebuild the temple to worship you the way you had prescribed for them through the prophet Moses. Father, we know it's a very detailed, we study the Torah, we know it's a very detailed uh, process and all kinds of ordinances and rules. And, you know, we, <laughs> we would call it tradition, but the way they went about worship was prescribed by you. Now, I think the way we go about worship is just absolutely fine. But it's also been described by you, prescribed by you. Jesus himself said that we are to remember him by the emblems that we are about to partake in. This, this is the most important time of our service. I can get up here and, and, and maybe teach a few things that will help encourage someone or help them understand the past, maybe put perspective on the present and the future. I don't know. But, but this one thing, this, this time of communion, Father, is what centers us. It brings us together 
as common people, as brothers and sisters in Christ. We proclaim this to one another as we pass the emblems and we take them, and we witness each other taking them, proclaiming your name. It's a, it's a moment of remembrance, but it's also a moment of edification where each one of us is encouraged by the other. We're encouraged, Father, knowing that our faith is not an empty faith. It's shared faith with so many people throughout the world who have placed their lives in the hands of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that during this time we would just humble ourselves and reflect upon that scene, the awful scene at Golgotha where Jesus gave up his life and died as an atonement, the perfect atoning sacrifice of our sins. And it wasn't just to put our sins off, it was to wipe them out. He was a propitiation of our sins. Father, we love you. We thank you for letting us have this time together this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.